Hello again, everybody. It's Mike Petralia, Trags. It's episode 248 of Patriots Beat on the CLNS Media Network. Follow us at online at www.clnsmedia.com. Of course, follow us on Twitter at CLNS Media. For all of our Patriots coverage, at Patriots CLNS. You can also follow me on Twitter at Trags, T-R-A-G-S. I want to welcome back Kevin Duffy of Mass Live, MassLive.com. Kevin, how you doing? Good, Trags. Appreciate Thank- you having me on. Uh, oh, my pleasure. Always uh, great info from yourself and uh, the folks over at Mass Live. Uh, you enjoying? You catching up some rest? I know it's OTA's time, but are you getting a chance to uh, get a little bit of a breather? Oh yeah, definitely. I've had, um, I've had weddings and bachelor parties, and so you've had a life. Been, yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> I guess you could say that. I've caught up with you, and uh, you know, we'll jump right into it here. I've caught up with you on the Celtics beat, and this is a good segue into the first topic I want to talk about, and that's Bill Belichick and his admiration for Brad Mm -hmm. Stevens. I found this really fascinating. A great job by Greg Bedard of Boston Sports Journal to catch up with the Patriots coach, calling Brad Stevens the driving force behind the Celtics' success. Uh, I'll quote uh, Belichick here as he told Bedard, Coach Stevens is incredible. He always points out that the players are the ones, and we've heard this many times, Kevin, who regardless of the situation have made this a special team, defying all expectations and adversity, game after game after game. But he, uh, Belichick says, but he clearly is a driving force behind it. Coach Stevens is a phenomenal person, leader, teacher, and strategist, and the job he does is a model for all coaches. Wow. How do you respond to that? I mean, that is, you know, arguably the greatest football coach in history, um, Mm -hmm. giving, you know, some incredible praise to Brad Stevens. And uh, you covered some of the Celtics playoff games with me. And you got a chance to see Brad Stevens up close. Um, different type of style. I think there's a little bit more relaxed personality to his approach with the media. Uh, but still, mm-hmm. the X's and O's and his discipline are what stand out to me in terms of a similarity between he and Belichick. Yeah, I mean, just the fact that they, I think from a tactical standpoint, they've pretty much mastered their uh, sport is what stands out. I'm curious, did he say... Stevens is the driving force or a driving force? Uh, a Next driving coach. force. A driving force. Okay, that makes more sense. Because I was going to say, if he said the driving force, that's, you know, that would almost be discredited. I'm glad you're players. paying close but, attention yeah. to my words here. I'm trying to quote it accurately. Apparently, I can't read straight. But, no, he said a driving force. A driving force. Okay. And then he's right. And that's, um, you know, Belichick praises a lot of people, but when he goes so strong with it, like he did with Brad Stevens, you can tell just how much he respects uh, the person. And I think, um, you know, after that, I was, I was kind of thinking along the lines that you were, where there are some similarities between the two. I think that they're both pretty, you know, they both intend to be boring in press conferences. They don't really want to give away too much or even show too much personality. I think Stevens is pretty, in a different way than Belichick, it's, it's not, he's not really as, like, he doesn't obviously have a reputation for being rude at all. Stevens doesn't, but they're both pretty tight lipped. And I would say that the major difference between the two coaches is just the atmosphere that Stevens has kind of created. And I think that there was some criticism of this after game seven. It, it just allows all his players to feel um, pretty comfortable with, with being the ones to take the big shots and, and, you know, it's like an equal opportunity type deal. And that worked out really well for the Celtics throughout the year. And it, maybe in, in game seven, I think in hindsight, people have been saying, well, you know, they should have been forcing the ball to Jason Tatum rather than having Rozier and, and Marcus Smart gunning threes. Um, so I think that, that that that's just an interesting wrinkle to Stevens where I know football is a different sport, but Belichick's really known as kind of a, um, like a, you know, he's got control over everything, over every single little detail, and it's it's almost the opposite where um, players aren't the players certainly aren't allowed to to run free and be themselves, and uh, it that's obviously worked for him. Now I think 
a lot of that is probably just the difference in football and basketball. But um, that's what that's one thing I thought of when I was thinking. Listen, I was like, wait, are these guys really similar? Even though they don't come across as such, and I thought of that difference, and it kind of goes to show you that I think there are different ways to coach, and there are different ways to be great. And in Boston, we're fortunate enough to have to definitely the greatest football coach to ever do it. And then you know, with Stevens running the Celtics, they should be very good for the next 10 to 12 years. Uh, I think I, I, they've got, they've got everything set up to be one of the next dominant teams in the NBA. Well, what struck me post game game seven, you know, and I was front and center uh, for those press conferences. And when Brad came out, he had this sort of relaxed grin on his face. Like he was appreciating the moment that this, you know, yes, he just, was eliminated um but i think he appreciated the run of his players and i certainly don't think you would get that same type of expression on the face after belichick when when belichick loses a game even you know even in those seasons where the team did as well as they could given the circumstances and um you look at what was it 2015 when they were injured and lost in denver uh 20 to 18 when the two-point conversion yeah. failed um you know, he was devastated, but he stayed up at the podium and answered question after question after question, um, wanting to give praise to his team for fighting through all of the adversity that his team did. But but the look on his on Belichick's face was much different than the look on Steven's face. And I don't know if that's just a, you know, a result of uh, or a factor of uh, Brad being much younger and not as worn as Bill from those situations? What do you think? I I don't know. I, I think it's tough to say because I just feel like Brad's the kind of guy who doesn't – I mean, the Bill doesn't really show much much when they win either, though. It's, uh, they're, they're similar in that way. They don't really – they just don't really show much. Um, I think Bill maybe has expectations that – they should or ha- they should have a very good chance every year to win. And like in, even in 2015, they were really beaten down by injuries. But yes. They were extremely close to winning that game at Denver in the AFC Championship. And then Denver beat Carolina pretty easily in the Super Bowl. And I think, you know, I think Bill looks at it every year when they get to the Final Four is, well, he knows that they have a major, major advantage in coaching, which I think goes – even further in football than it does in basketball. I think Bill's impact on the, on a, a single game in football is greater than Steven's impact on a single game in basketball. And they have a major advantage at quarterback. So just with those two things alone, even no matter what else is happening with the rest of the roster, I feel like Bill almost expects them to have a, a great chance to win the Super Bowl. So when they don't do it, it, it is a major letdown. And then with Steven's, I think you're up 3-2, and, you know, he knows that they probably had a good chance to go to the finals. It was probably a coin flip whether they were going to – once they were up 3-2, it was a coin flip whether they were going to win or LeBron was going to win two games in a row. Um, but I think that he's aware of, um, you know, beating LeBron is no easy task. And then even if you beat LeBron, and it, it, it would have been a great achievement to get to the NBA Finals, but the Celtics were not going to win the NBA Finals this year. I mean, Golden State – would have won that series, I think, in six games minimum, or maximum, I guess I should say. So I just feel like the expectations might be a little bit different um, between Belichick and Stevens, and that that might change. I'd like to see what Stevens' expression is next year if if Irving and and, uh, Gordon Hayward are healthy and and they lose in the conference finals. I don't know if he'll he'll be as, as relaxed and kind of reflective as he was because I think it's just... You know your your mood is dictated by what you, what your expectations are, and I think this team exceeded his expectations and everyone's expectations. Well, I mean, in that regard, it's a lot like the two thousand and one Patriots, right? I mean, I Belichick has gone on record often saying how that mm-hmm. two thousand and one team wasn't 
he didn't expect it to compete for the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl that year. I mean, he was very pleasantly surprised. And once they got there, certainly he thought that they could win the game. But big scheme, big picture. He never thought that that team was ready to get to the NBA, uh, to the uh, Super Bowl and win it. Uh, it was the teams in 03 and 04 that he thought were really um, prepared and, and ready to take it on. And maybe that's where Brad Stevens is at this point uh, with the Celtics, even though Brad has been there now five years. Um, you know, he's really built up a, a, a program and a system that obviously has caught the eyes of Bill Belichick. Let's move on to something else. And not every player does appreciate uh, Bill Belichick. And I think you know where we're moving <laughs> in regard yeah. to uh, the next subject we want to bring up, and that's former uh, defensive end Cassius Marsh. He said that he is so glad to be out of here. He didn't have fun playing in Foxborough for the Patriots. But the quote that sticks out more than any other is when he says, I confronted him about all the things that were going on, him being Bill Belichick. I won't get into detail, but it was BS things that they were doing. I just wasn't a fan. And you know what my reaction is? And and millions of Patriots fans reacted the same way. Oh, really? You, <laughs> you confronted Bill Belichick after stinking up the joint and not being able to cover and, and do, you know, Basic responsibilities asked of you by Matt Patricia and the defense. Yeah. Look, I mean, and, and Shane McClellan came out in his uh, sort of his defense saying that not everybody has the same experience in New England. He tweeted it, you know, on Tuesday, and let's not all kill um, Cassius Marsh. But when you say you confronted Bill Belichick because you weren't playing well and weren't getting the right type of opportunities in his in his scheme. Uh, don't you laugh a little bit? Yeah, I, I don't really know what he's getting at when he's saying, you know, the BS things that were happening. I just don't, I don't really know what that means. Um, I think what he I means is he wasn't being used so, properly. That's what I think he's getting at. Yeah, well, I mean, if that's the case, then I mean, sorry, man. Like you, <laughs> they've 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 got a specific role. I, you know, I don't think that, like, for example, I don't think Chris Long was probably crazy about the exact way he was being used when he was here for that one year. Um, but Chris Long wanted to win. And I mean, you saw the look on his face when they won the Super Bowl. he was popping the champagne uh, in the locker room. And even when he left for Philadelphia, he said, uh, I really appreciated my time in New England and I want to go somewhere where I think I want to be used, uh, where I'm going to be used. Um, the way I want to. So I'm, I'm paraphrasing that. It's not exactly, sure. That's roughly what he said. Um, so I think it's typical for – there's 53 players on each team. There's going to be many players on every team that are unhappy with where they're at. Uh, and that's certainly the case for the Patriots. I'm sure it's not an easy place to play. And um, if you come from a, a place where they do things one way and you get to the Patriots, it might – be a pretty radical uh, transition, uh, I think. So in, in that regard, it wasn't surprising. I, I wasn't surprised by it. It didn't take me, uh, you know, but I think uh, I think Marsh is just one of the few guys who, who is willing to speak up and be honest about that. Uh, I think if everyone in the NFL was honest about their experience at a certain place, there would be a lot of trashing and, you know, uh, it, it's just not limited to New England. I think that, that that happens when there's a sport where there's 53 guys on the roster and it, and each team does things, especially on defense, a little differently. Like you might play a position, but outside linebacker in New England might not look quite like outside linebacker in Seattle or in San Francisco. So um, it, it was, it was, I mean, it was pretty random just because of like the time of year and uh, the player, because he, he kind of, he did flame out of here pretty quickly. And uh, I think that it's just received a little bit of attention because there's not much else going on football wise. So, you know, we all have to write and talk about something. So I think it, we all just kind of latched onto it. If this happened, if he had said this, maybe uh, during the season, it would have been, it definitely would have been a thing for a day. Um, and that would have been 
pretty much it. But it, it might not even, depending on what was going on, it might not have been the biggest story involving the Patriots that day. So I think it's just a few factors. But uh, I did have to admit, I did chuckle at it too. It was kind of funny to, to read that quote. And then he doubles down. Um, yeah. And Kevin and says, I'm grateful to be away from there when he was <laughs> asked about it on Tuesday. But whatever. I mean, I remember being on the field pregame uh, in Tampa, uh, watching him go through his drills. And it looked like he was, you know, working really hard and trying to work on his up and under moves. And, and uh, you know, there was nobody really in front of him except an assistant coach. I don't know. I mean, you know, he was he had his opportunity here. It didn't fit in well. And, you know, that's why I think the guys who understand that it's a different beast in Foxborough are the ones who I think um, who might not be comfortable at first but make adjustments are the ones who survive here. Um, those who try to fight it and say, you're just not using me the right way, I don't. Th- I think yeah. their tenure in Foxborough is going to be very short-lived. I, that's what experience has always taught me about right. those kind of players. Yeah, yeah, and it's, Belichick will take chances on talent, and th- that's the thing when you make a trade, you just never, you can do all the background work you want and, you know, have as many contacts as, uh, as you, you can reach out to to try to gauge a player's character and how they how they might fit in and project it, but you never really know until they get there. And Cassius Marsh is a guy that they they got right before the season. They gave up a fifth and a seventh to get him, and uh, I think they had high hopes for him. But he just, as you said, it never really worked out on the field. Um, he played, I believe, he played a good amount in that season opener against Kansas City, and I. I assume he was pretty bad in that game. Honestly. Well, there's one picture, I, I, uh, and let, let me interrupt you, that uh, Mike Riley tweeted out, uh, yeah. 98.5, and it's epic. Um, it is a picture of him falling face first into the turf at Foxborough while a chief runner uh, sprints toward the end zone. Yeah, well, he, he was he was in coverage on the – well, he wasn't – he got caught in coverage. I don't know if it was actually supposed to be on the Kareem Hunt, the long 58-yard touchdown. That's Correct. Right. Um, so the one play that sticks out to me from Cassius Marsh is the Melvin Gordon 87-yard touchdown uh, against the Chargers in Week Eight. I want to say it was he just Marsh just uh, he was supposed to set the edge and he just got wiped out and Gordon was able to turn the corner and basically went untouched to the end zone. So um, there was he he just you know as that season reached its midpoint he was just not he was not going to be a contributing player for them. They. You know, it was so bad that they cut him, and then they went out and replaced him with uh, Eric Lee, who they signed off the Bills practice squad, an undrafted rookie. So um, not every trade works out, and I think what you're saying is, is 100% true. Uh, it's the guys who embrace it and have a better chance of, of it working out. And from Belichick's perspective, you just you try your best to identify who those guys will be, but you're going to miss sometimes, and... Um, that's just the nature of uh, kind of the way the Patriots fill their roster. I mean, they're, it's it's a trading game. I mean, they're always trading, you know, a, a fifth round pick for a veteran or somebody on their team for a fifth round pick. They're just kind of taking shots here and there and seeing what will work. And that particular one with Cassius Marsh just didn't work out. Speaking with Kevin Duffy, Patriots outstanding reporter for MassLive.com, want to tell you about a new wellness brand for men. It's called hymns for hymns.com specifically 66 percent of men lose their hair by the age of 35 thing is when you start to notice hair loss it's too late it's easier to keep the hair you have than to replace the hair you've lost how will you feel a year from now if it's business as usual up there well there's a solution guys for hymns.com a one-stop shop for hair loss skin care and sexual wellness for men thanks to science baldness can now be optional hymns connects you with real doctors and medical grade solutions to treat hair loss well-known generic equivalents to name brand prescriptions to help keep your hair order now my listeners get a trial month of hymns for just five dollars today right now while supplies last see the website for full details this would cost hundreds if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy, go to forhims.com slash trags. That's F O R H I M S dot com slash T R A G S forhims.com slash trags. All right, OTAs and minicamp coming up. Uh, Kevin, what you're looking for? What sticks out to you that you want to see in terms maybe of the young players and the newcomers uh, coming on board? 
Uh, young, I mean, there's there's so much for the young players, I guess. Uh, well, I'll just go down a quick list. Sure. Um, I got in my head here. Number one for me, I actually was unable to attend the first OTA, so this this coming uh, Thursday will be my first look at the team. And I, I I saw some some video clips, but I want to see Julian Edelman in person and see how he's progressing from that torn ACL. If he's back to anywhere near um, the quickness and elusiveness that, that he had before. Because he's a guy who you can tell just the way he moves on the field, even when they're not in full pads. It's almost like a different speed than, than some other guys. That's at least been my experience watching him. Yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah, he's just so quick and so explosive off his cuts. Um, so I'm just curious to see if that's back. I know Malcolm Mitchell has been – kind of in and out. He was not at the um, OTA that the media attended a week ago. Uh, I, he has been featuring some of the pictures on the team's website, so he definitely he has some level of attendance. But, I mean, to me, that's his attendance this spring and summer is going to be huge because they've got great depth at that position. And if his knee still is a problem and they can't count on him, I mean, I like him as a player a lot, but they might not end up keeping him just because they, they've got so many other guys who you might be able to rely on more. Um, I'm sticking with the receivers. I, I'm i real interested to just get a look at Cordero Patterson from an athletic standpoint. Um, do you think, who, to cut you off there, do you think he can yeah. be more than just a specialist, though? Uh, uh, well, yeah, that's one of my it, – it's hard to say because he is 27 years old, so – I think he's 27. So eventually, you are what you are. Eventually, you, you reach an age where you're really not going to get that much better. But I don't know if he's ever worked with a, an offensive coach like Josh McDaniels and played with a guy like Tom Brady. So maybe that's going to have um, some kind of impact. And I, Yeah, I wonder if the Patriots can make him into a well-rounded or a, a better-rounded wide receiver. And if they don't, I wonder – I wonder if they're going to try to get the ball in his hands a little bit more than some of these other teams. He's, aside from returns, he's only averaged 2.4 touches from scrimmage per game throughout his career, and that number has actually gone down and down uh, each year. I, think, I believe his rookie year is when he had the most touches. Uh, I wonder if the Patriots can find ways to get the ball in his hands four or five times from scrimmage, um, just because he's when you watch him. I mean. He's so strong for a receiver. He runs through tackles. He runs around guys. He's probably the fastest guy in the field. Uh, there's just so much big play potential there with him. So I, I'm just really interested to see how McDaniels and the Patriots are going to get creative with Patterson. Uh, so I, to your I don't point, know answer your question. Yeah, yeah, to your point, though, he's been as explosive as a running back, you know, running uh, end arounds and whatnot, as he has – uh, you know, as a receiver, and that is obviously because a lot of these NFL coaches see the same thing you did that you just pointed out. He is incredibly strong with the ball in his hands. His rookie year yep. with Minnesota, you remember this? 12 carries, 158 yards for the season, three touchdowns. Last year with Oakland, 13 carries, 121 yards, and two touchdowns yep. running the ball. Yeah, that's how. That's what they've done. It's been... It's been um... Sometimes handoffs in the backfield, jet sweeps, a lot of wide receiver screens. The wide receiver screens probably account for a quarter or a third of his reception. So it's like really basic stuff, just getting the ball in his hands and letting him operate. And that's going to – I'm sure the Patriots will do that. I just wonder if they're going to do some other stuff with him as well. Maybe have him, you know, come across the field on some shallow crossing routes, uh, get him get him running full speed. Um I don't know. I mean, there's the, the Josh McDaniels. I'm sure has plenty of ideas because when you watch, when you watch this guy, there's just few players that move the way he does with the ball in his hands. And I would think that you'd want to try to take full advantage of that. How about Jordan Matthews? I mean, I, I think we all assume that Hogan and Julian Edelman are one, two. Um, on the yeah. depth chart, and in terms of wide receivers, we're assuming Julian Edelman's going to come back full strength, full go. And I, I think, given his work ethic, I don't see there's any reason not to expect that but then you have a guy like Jordan Matthews uh signed uh, in the off season from Buffalo um you think he can be a, a big contributor right out of the shoot yeah I, I think Jordan Matthews can have an awesome season for them and 
I, I'm hesitant to say he's a lock to make the team just because of the depth of that position. Uh, but I, I really liked him um, personally when we met him with the media. And he just, he's been really productive as a slot receiver. He led the NFL in, slot, in yards out of the slot from 2014 to 16 uh, in those, th- those three years in aggregate. Um, and he, he brings a different, he's not like the prototype prototypical Patriots slot receiver. He's not 5'10", 185 pounds and really quick. He's 6'2", 215, and his strength is, is his uh, catch radius and his, his physical strength. Like He's a big guy. So I think he can give you a different look out of the slot, and if you carry on the roster, both him and, say, Braxton Berrios, the rookie, you have two slot options who – could potentially be very effective in different matchups because they're both so different. And of course, Edelman can do a lot of that stuff too. So uh, I'm very, yeah, I, I think Jordan Matthews could end up having a great year for them. I think it was just a stunning signing, just given how low the contract was. Like his, I believe he signed one year for just over a million dollars. Yep. Contrast that with uh, Dante Moncrief signed with the Jaguars one year for $9.6 million. Um, I don't really know how the Patriots were able to pull that off because the wide receiver market was pretty insane. There was a lot of guys who got a lot of money at that position. And George Matthews, for whatever reason, I don't know if he turned down more from other teams. I, I'm assuming he did because his contract was so low. Uh, and that's just that's kind of the, the pull of playing for the Patriots, that they, they can swing things like that. So, uh, what are you going to be doing the rest of the summer after the OTAs? Just uh, resting up and getting ready for July? Yeah, yeah, no major plans, I don't think. I got a few. I'm at that age where all your all your friends are getting married, basically. So, I've, I think I've got two more weddings to go. Um, Look at you. So, a lot yeah, of bachelor parties, yeah. huh? Yeah, well, one more. Yep, yeah, one more bachelor party, two more weddings. Um, so that'll eat up quite a bit of time and you know july is always a pretty slow month for us and you know tracks we hit yep. once <laughs> we hit a week before training camp you hit the ground running and and training camp is probably my favorite time of the year covering the team i know why because yeah why is, why is that i think because you actually get to see the team play football yeah. well in that, practice. Yeah, that's definitely i just like the well i love the summer and i love the warm weather so i love being outside and just, you know, just sitting in the sun watching them. And it's like an everyday thing. And because you're there watching every minute of it, you feel like you're more a part of it, I guess, than yep. you do during the season. Like, yep. you're, <laughs> it sounds stupid to say that you're, like, in it with them. But, like, it's – I mean, we're, we're talking about every day, Gillette, including the weekends. It's just it, – that becomes, like, what your life is at that point. Um, and it's – it is very fun. I look forward to training camp every year. So, I'm sure – uh, this year will be no different. And what uh, give you a chance to tell people how they can follow you again, Kevin? Okay, on Twitter, um, at Kevin R. Duffy. All my stuff is at mathlive.com or mathlive.com slash patriots. And I do not have Instagram or I do have a professional Facebook that I don't really use too much. So I think we'll, we'll limit it to those two. That sounds good, Kevin. That's a deal. I want to thank everybody for downloading today's Patriots Beat. want to once again thank our terrific guest, Kevin Duffy from MassLive.com. You know how to follow him now. I'll say it again on Twitter, at Kevin R. Duffy. You can also give us a follow, at Patriots CLNS, and follow me on Twitter, at Trags, T-R-A-G-S. Today's sponsor, 4 For Patriots content manager, Mike Alonji, CLNS media executive producer, Larry H. Russell, the founder of the network, Nick Gelso. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. This is Mike Petralia, and this is the Patriots Beat Podcast, powered by CLNS Media. What's going on, Pass Nation? This is Marvin Zone of the CLNS Media Network, and I'm here to tell you right now to check out the CLNS Media New England Patriots postgame show hosted by myself and my co-host, Mr. Mike Nice. And live on CLNS Radio immediately after every single Pass game, call in at 929-477-2386 toll-free to get your voice heard and contribute to the host breakdown and analysis of the latest Patriots contest. We also got the stars and sorries of the day, Twitter posts for the plays of the game, and everything else that is going on with the five-time Super Bowl champion. 
Subscribe to CLNS Media New England Patriots Post Game Show on iTunes and Stitcher. And the best way, download the free CLNS Media Network mobile app for on-demand listening anytime, anyplace, anywhere.